Hey, RP Plus RPU, Dr. James Hoffman here, and today we're gonna to talk a little bit about flexibility and mobility training for your strength conditioning programs. Now, today you're gonna to get a little flavor of my take on some of this stuff. In a later course, you can look up a little bit more specific and more in-depth recommendations from somebody like, I think Dr. Quinn Hanak's gonna be giving that one, so stay tuned for that one in the future. We're gonna have an even more in-depth talk on this. This is more just to kind of wet your whistle and get you excited about talking about this a little bit more formally. So first off for today, we're gonna to talk about defining some terms, and this is again kind of my evidence-based opinion, so you can take it or leave it. I used to tell my students they could have their own opinions on the matter after they passed my class. So you can take that same option here and then take the class, see if you like it, and then take whatever you can from it and go forth and conquer in your own way. So you're gonna hear my definition of terms, how I approach these two things and make sure we have clear, concise definitions that we're talking about. We're gonna talk about how to actually develop flexibility and mobility for a strength conditioning based program. And then I'll give you some practical recommendations on how to implement this into the real world. So let's get started, moving on to the first slide. So flexibility and mobility are kind of hot words in the fitness industry right now. It seems that flexibility, Training, mobility training can cure all ails, right? You need to recover more, do more flexibility. You wanna snatch more, do more flexibility. You wanna be able to bench 500? Well, you need to be more flexible. Is that really the case? How important are flexibility and mobility in the world of strength conditioning? Well, it's gonna be kinda of hard to say, so we have to start breaking it down a little bit. What do these things actually mean? When we say that our athlete needs to be more flexible or more mobile, what are we actually suggesting that they need to improve upon? These are things that need to be made more clear. How much time should we dedicate to these concepts? Of course you've heard me and Mike rant about time effort, recoverability are all finite. You don't have infinite time, you don't have infinite effort to allocate to infinite resources, right? So as a strength conditioning coach, a sport, as a sports scientist, you're going to have to weigh the things that you are doing in training in terms of their relative importance. So then the question is, how important is flexibility and mobility training to my athlete? And how much time am I gonna allocate for that? And then of course, we gotta weigh the benefits and risks just like with anything else. So there's probably a distinct benefit to doing flexibility and mobility training but there probably does come at a distinct cost as well. So those are things that we want to establish. Let's move on to the next one. For our purposes, I have made some, what I think are really, really good uh, definitions and some guidelines for flexibility and mobility. So obviously they're two different words, they're gonna have two different meanings. So let's look at the slide. The first one we're gonna look at is flexibility. The way that I like to look at flexibility is as follows. A non-specific evaluation of the range of motion about a given joint or muscle action. So again, non-specific, we're just looking at how far does a certain muscle action or a certain joint move in whatever direction that it goes, right? So essentially we're trying to find the full length until the terminal end where it has to stop. So generally if we're training for flexibility, this implies that we're trying to increase the terminal range of motion for that muscle action or joint movement, right? And that again could be external rotation of the shoulder, it can be hip flexion extension, it can be all sorts of things, right? So if we're saying we wanna improve flexibility, we're essentially saying we're trying to do things that will increase the terminal range of motion for whatever joint or muscle action we're talking about. We can do this bilaterally, two sides. We can do it unilaterally, just one side. We can look at really, really finite movements, and we can look at really, really gross movements, like a sit and reach type thing, right? So lots and lots of applications for flexibility. No brainer there, right? The next one on the list we see is mobility. The first thing that we have to dis distinguish from flexibility is that this is a task-specific assessment, meaning it has characteristics of specificity. We're looking at your ability to do something. Whereas with flexibility, we're just looking at how far the joint goes, right? Regardless of what we're actually doing, regardless of what sport you're in or what movements you're trying to assess. Mobility implies that there is some type of task specificity involved, meaning can I squat to depth? Can I crouch down with an arch back? Can I do my uh, hurdling movements for track and field? Things like that. So there's some type of task that we need to establish, right? Then once we've established the task specificity, we're looking at the range of motion required to perform the task with optimal technique. Now we're not saying perform the task with crappy technique and do a bad job there. We're saying the range of motion necessary to do it with the best technique that we reasonably can. Now you might have heard other people say like there is no best technique everyone's a little bit different. And that is largely true, right? So there are some commonalities for best technique that we can look out for. And then there's gonna be a little bit of wiggle room based on an individual's anthropometry and preference and stuff like that. But for the most part, we should know what their best technique is gonna look like. So we're saying, what is the range of motion required to do exactly that? 
And then one other piece of the puzzle that many people seem to leave off of, when we're talking about mobile, excuse me, mobility, we're also regarding the ability to generate forces needed for athletic performance within that full range of motion, including all the way up to the terminal end. So now we have a task specific assessment, specific assessment, excuse me. We're looking at the range of motion required to do the task and we're looking at the intrinsic ability to generate forces while doing that full range of motion within the task, right? So not just part of the range of motion, not just the beginning, not just the middle. We're saying from start to finish, can I control and generate forces throughout the entirety of the range of motion? So now we see not only is there a range of motion component, there's also a strength component as well. So I think these are some of the big differentiating factors between flexibility and mobility. Flexibility, non-specific, how far does the joint go? Mobility, task specific, we're looking at the range of motion needed to have the best technique and the strength characteristics to control the body throughout that entirety of the range of motion. Make sense? I think that's pretty good. You know, hopefully somebody can make a better one, but I think it's a pretty good starting point. All right. So at this point, if you're thinking about it, you should probably be realizing in order for one to be mobile, therefore, they should have some degree of flexibility, right? Because the flexibility is just how far does the joint go? Mobility, generally, we're going to cap that off and say, well, we might not need to go all the way, but we do have to hit a certain level of range of motion, right? Now, what we want to do is establish kind of upper and lower bounds for these things. One thing that I think people get into the bad habit of doing is saying like, well, Flexibility training is inherently good. It can do no wrong. Therefore, I should try and be as flexible as possible. When in reality, there's probably kind of an upper limit as to what we need in terms of our mobility characteristics, again, being a task-specific assessment, and then we probably don't need to allocate a whole lot of resources to it anymore, right? So if you look at the slide, I have a couple examples. We have weightlifter guy who's doing a snatch, obviously requires a very large range of motion, and he has to be able to control that whole range of motion from that overhead squat position all the way up. Whereas the bottom one, we have Mystery Pretzel Ginger, who I have no idea what she's doing in this picture, but it's pretty hilarious. She obviously is in a highly contorted position, a lot of flexibility there, probably not much control. So we can kind of see some differences here and what we're looking at between somebody who is highly flexible versus somebody who is very, very mobile for their sport. Again, if we go to the next slide, we can see kind of a classic example of this. The first one we have is the yogi, right? Somebody who has incredible range of motion, probably some of the best range of motion characteristics on the planet. They can do things that are just inconceivable for a lot of us. Why? Because they spend a lot of time working on flexibility. On the other side, we have the gymnast, who is somebody who also can achieve really, really big ranges of motion. However, can control their bodies within those ranges of motion as well. So I think this is kind of the dichotomy of the two where we have flexibility on the side of the yogi, mobility kind of on the side, the extreme side of the gymnast where we have somebody who can move in incredible ranges of motion but can demonstrate almost complete control throughout the entirety of those ranges. Pretty cool. And that's also why we typically see the gymnasts are a little bit more jacked than yogis on average, right? Let's go on to the next one. So. In order for us to kind of establish upper and lower bounds, of course, if you've heard me rant before, we need to have some type of testing and monitoring in there as well, right? So we have to be able to kind of numerically assess this or at the very least qualitatively assess this. So how can we do that? There's a ton of different tests out there that you can do. Typically, we first look at range of motion tests like goniometry um, and doing like just basic stretch tests, right? So if you've never done goniometry before, it's essentially just putting kind of um, uh, it's just a marker of the joint angle, and you can look at how far does my bicep uh, flex and extend, how far does my hip flex and extend, stuff like that. Really easy, very common in areas of like athletic training, physical therapy, stuff like that. In exercise science, we tend to use more flexibility type tests like sit and reach, things like that. Any are fine. We can also start to get a little bit fancier. We can look at 2D and 3D movement analyses. 2D movement analysis has come a long way. There's a lot of different apps out there that you can just download onto your iPhone or your um, iPad. You can actually just record your athlete doing whatever they're doing and you can actually put little vectors on there. It's really, really neat. Some of them will even actually measure joint angle changes and stuff, which is pretty cool. On the 3D side, it's a lot more complicated. This is where you have to actually put markers all over their body, put them in a specialized room with all the cameras and move, see how they move around, right? A little bit more invasive, but doable. And we can actually look at how their joints actually move around, which is pretty cool. We used to do this with the men's golf team, and that's why I put the golf figure on the uh, slide here, because we would actually do the 3D movement analysis for our golfer swing. We would actually make a little screensaver for them to give back to them when they were done, but then we would give the data to the coaches and say, okay, now we can actually look at how they're swinging, put some quantitative to our qualitative as well.
Uh, one that's really common that I'm just going to give a little bit of a preface here, functional movement screening. FMS is something that gets lots of hype. The hype calmed down for a while and then it made a small resurgence again more recently. FMS is something that can be used to assess flexibility, mobility, and kind of uh, like structural imbalances. What it is not good for is predicting sport performance. This is where you have to draw the line. So what does the research on FMS show? FMS sh does not correlate with performance in any meaningful way. Meaning somebody can score really, really well on an FMS test and just be totally crappy at their sport. Conversely, they can score really crappy uh, and be the best NBA player you've ever seen, right? So it doesn't really correlate with performance in any meaningful way. However, it can be useful in assessing flexibility and mobility characteristics. And again, this is something that like athletic trainers, physical therapists do all the time. It's not something we see quite as much in uh, sport and exercise sciences, but should be acknowledged and can be a useful tool. However, you just don't wanna make up protocols um, on the spot. There are very well established protocols that you might have to dip into athletic training uh, literature to kind of to delve into, but they can be really useful. And then of course, you've probably heard me say this before, qualitative analysis, your coach's eye goes a long way. If you've been involved in sport for a long time or involved in training for a long time, you have a pretty good idea of how these things are supposed to look. If it looks like shit, smells like shit, tastes like shit, it's probably shit, right? So you can use your coach's eye and you can evaluate how the person is moving, how their technique looks, or if they look really stiff, rigid, and unable to hit the technique because of flexibility, you can probably tell that, right, just by looking at at them. So obviously we want to have some numbers to back up our qualitative. If you can only use qualitative, that's okay. Don't be afraid of using observation, right? But we want to hopefully have some numbers to back it up as well. So there's just some tests that we can do. It's not by any means comprehensive, but here's kind of a quick, simple way to start evaluating flexibility. Let's move on. So indeed, if you have somebody and one of our goals is to establish a high degree of mobility for sport, they have to have some degree of flexibility, right? So that essentially would imply that in order to become more mobile for your sport, you have to train flexibility at least concurrently to some degree. Maybe not all the time, but at least some of the time. So what are the most effective strategies generally to improving flexibility? Well, one of the things that is probably a no-brainer for everybody is static stretching. Now, static stretching is not something you wanna do when the muscle is cold, like when you just wake up and roll out of bed. Probably something you wanna do after you've trained, maybe later, uh, a little like a little while after the training session, maybe not immediately following the training session. and tons and tons of stuff on static stretching. Hopefully we don't need to talk about this too much, but typical stretch and hold type things. Really what this is getting you accustomed to is kind of the pain threshold and tolerance to being in a loaded stretched position. It doesn't actually seem to make huge improvements in flexibility, at least in the short term. In the long term it can, in the short term, really just improves your tolerance to being stretched which is kind of still kind of cool, but it takes a lot of static stretching to make a chronic improvement. Dynamic stretching, same idea. However, this can be used a little bit more before exercise. This generally is a little bit more full range of motion, active stretching, usually like our dynamic warm-up type stuff, where we're doing high knees, butt kicks, leg swings, arm swings, things like that, arm circles, can be very useful to get the person ready uh, to move in a full range of motion for whatever training session that they're about to do. One of the ones that always comes up all the time for our recovery talks is massage and foam rolling. And one of the things that's really interesting, we'll talk about foam rolling a little bit more specifically, is these typically have very, very little to do with actual physical recovery, but they can have a pretty pronounced effect on acute flexibility characteristics. So what we have found is that doing something like foam roll or getting like a really, really high pressure massage in a certain area can actually downregulate some of your reflex responses for a little while, your GTO and muscle spindle response, excuse me, muscle spindle reflex responses. And for a short amount of time, probably 20 minutes or less, uh, and that's generous, uh, will allow for a slightly enhanced range of motion on the affected area, which is pretty cool. So we kind of downregulate our nervous system response, which will let us tolerate a slightly greater stretch. Now, there's no chronic effect of doing this. This effect is completely acute. And we're talking on the scale of minutes, right? Not even days, we're talking minutes. Very, very short. However, the benefit of doing this type of, uh, this type of uh, excuse me, massage or foam rolling is that it will allow you temporarily to train in a full range of motion, right? One of the few things that actually can affect the muscle's ability to stretch and become more flexible is doing loaded eccentric movements, which 
hopefully most of you who have watched these videos knows that's like our standard weight training movement stuff, right? Any of our resistance training movements have an upward phase and a downward phase. The downward phase generally is where the muscle is being stretched under load the most. And it turns out that's probably one of the best ways to actually increase the intrinsic muscle ability to become more flexible. So does massage or foam rolling play a, dis a direct distinct role in increasing flexibility? Only acutely, right? The chronic effect comes from allowing people to train in a full range of motion. So you have the temporary effect, which allows them to do a little deeper squats, a little deeper pressing. That deeper squatting, deeper pressing is what allows them to see chronic gains in flexibility. See where I'm going with that? And then last on this list, it's gonna sound weird, vibration. Vibration is one of those really crazy weird ones where if you vibrate somebody for whatever reason, their flexibility, their range of motion goes through the roof for a short amount of time. This is something I have done with my athletes and on myself, uh, and it's a acute, pronounced, measurable effect. You do it, boom, for a little while, they're way more flexible. Same idea with the foam roll. It's an acute effect, but the chronic effect comes from allowing that person to hit ranges of motion in their training that they normally would not hit. Make sense? Awesome. Let's move on to the next one. So then the question is, okay, those are strategies to make my person more flexible. How can I then make them more mobile? Right, so obviously all of those things, flexibility training is a part of that, so that's number one on our list. The next one, number two, highly associative or highly specific full range of motion weight training. Weight training is probably one of the best things you can do to actually increase mobility characteristics. Why? Well, full range of motion weight training actually can help increase the intrinsic flexibility of the muscle. It also trains the force characteristics of the muscle throughout the entirety of the range of motion, which is really, really important and part of our definition of mobility, right? So highly associative full range of motion weight training. Don't overthink this one, right? So we're talking about movements that will go through a full range of motion of hip flexion extension, uh, horizontal and... Uh, abduction and adduction, right? Things like that. You don't have to go, well, for sprinting, we never quite do a full high bar squat death movement, overthinking it a little bit, right? If you need to open up, like how much sagittal plane flexion extension you can do, high bar squat's probably a good idea or a straight leg deadlift, good idea, right? Things like that. So highly associative, meaning kind of for the movement in question, Full range of motion weight training cannot go wrong. This is one of those things that goes back years and years and years, decades. Like people will say, weight training makes you slower, makes you less flexible. Not true, right? Actually, weight training is one of those things that makes you stronger, which makes you faster, and it actually increases flexibility and mobility characteristics. Now, there's something to be said about becoming a really, really massive bodybuilder and actually gaining so much tissue that it starts closing off some of the joint spaces, right? That's normal, but that comes with the territory of being a bodybuilder. But the actual strength training doesn't make you less flexible. It actually makes you more flexible. Gaining lots of muscle mass can make you less flexible simply just from having more tissue in between your joints. Can't get around it, right? So that's a trade-off. And then last, we said first, flexibility training. Number two, full range of motion weight training related to whatever activity you're doing. Number three, and probably the most underrated, you still have to go out and actually practice your sport movements and sport techniques with the best technique and the best range of motion that you can. A lot of people will say, you know, I have a problem. I can't do my range of motion for my sport movements. I'm going to do everything in the world to get more range of motion, but practice my sport, which is really weird and really strange to me. So one of the best ways to improve technique, improve range of motion characteristics for your sport is to practice those sport skills and sport techniques. Don't throw that out the window and seek out all these crazy supplemental pink band behind the head, schmig, flamingos, whatever. Don't do that stuff. It's crazy, right? What are the things that are really going to have a big impact? Doing your stretching stuff, full range of motion, weight training, practicing your sport movements to the best of your ability, right? No brainer, to my opinion. Seems pretty simple, but it does pose some questions, right? Can one then become too flexible or too mobile? I would say probably. So generally what we find is that, and this is on the next slide, by the way, flexibility training in general is very positive and generally comes with pretty low minimal risks. However, training 
solely for the purpose of increasing your range of motion, the terminal range of motion, is not inherently good either. It does come at some distinct costs, right? So what we have found is that people who really, really pursue high degree of flexibility tend to have some problems. One, you can start running into increases in joint laxity, so you have a tendency for the joint to displace in unfavorable ways. This could be really, really bad, especially if you're involved in contact or combat sports, then the joint can actually pop out of place in some cases, really, really bad, so our joints get too loose for our own benefit. We can actually see decreases in the intrinsic stiffness of the muscle, which plays a role in its ability to do stretch shortening cycles and generate for high forces and high power output, so the actual muscle tissue stiffness gets loose and gets kind of laxed. And then we can actually see, in some cases, some decreases in your ability to actually generate movement through um, your neurons firing appropriately. And this is something they've kind of looked at, haven't quite validated yet, but this is under, also I should preface by saying, lots and lots and lots, high degrees of flexibility training. So what we need to know about flexibility is, it's generally not a big deal, right? And you should probably train flexibility as determined by your sport. What we have found though, is if you spend hours and hours and hours a day, especially if you're doing it pre-exercise, can predispose you to some, certain, uh, some very, very nasty problem. Let's go on to the next one. Some of the recent studies suggest if you do a lot of static stretching, and again, by a lot, we mean hours. We're not talking about like 30 minutes before you work out or after you work out. That's probably okay. We're talking, if you're doing hours of static stretching per day, we've actually documented people will start having decreases in strength, decreases in power output, and their risk of injury generally goes up, which is usually what most people think is the opposite. Most people think stretch so that you don't get hurt, right? Well, to some degree, that's true. But if you stretch too much, you actually increase your risk of injury. So... What we have found is that there probably are diminishing returns on doing flexibility and mobility training. There's probably some type of upper limit and therefore one can become too flexible and too mobile for their sport. Now again, there's a context there for whatever sport that you're doing. If you just wanna be the most flexible man in the world, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, go for it, right? But if you wanna be a rugby player, a weightlifter, power lifter, lacrosse player, there's probably an upper bound that we want to seek out. And then we also run into the problem again of allocating time and resource. And then one other thing to consider is that, and this is not something that has been fleshed out super explicitly, but it's been suggested in kind of recent literature, is that doing a lot of stretching, especially if you're trying to use it as a recovery modality, which first of all, doesn't work. Second of all, can actually start to interrupt some of the recovery adaptive processes, very similar as to how taking too many NSAIDs can. So we don't want to necessarily start relying too heavily on doing a lot of stretching. Let's move on to the next one. So in order to promote mobility in sport, we generally recommend three big things, right? We said, do your flexibility training, highly associative full range of motion weight training, and continue to keep practicing your sport techniques, right? And again, we want to reemphasize the thing with mobility is that we're also training the force generating characteristics of that range of motion. One of the things that you will find is that when somebody starts training some of these things, when they start training for flexibility, start trying to increase the range of motion, it actually comes relatively quickly when you start putting all these puzzle pieces together. It only takes a couple weeks to actually start seeing some marked improvements in the range of motion. But what happens when now you are squatting at three quarters depth, now you can squat all the way. Well, most of us who have figured that out or have tried, or who went from partial squatting to full squatting, figured out that, yeah, it's a lot harder, right? And sometimes you don't have the strength in the bottom end of that movement or whatever movement that you're doing. So what does that mean? That means as you are concurrently gaining range of motion, you also need to be concurrently gaining strength throughout that range of motion. That is a huge component that I think a lot of people throw to the wayside where they are happy to see improvements in flexibility, but then don't actually start training within that newly achieved range of motion, which is critical. So you have to be strong in that range of motion as well. So again, in order to benefit from that new flexibility and try and gain more optimal technique, you have to be able to generate and manage your forces throughout the entirety of that range of motion. So gain range, gain strength concurrently, and that will help improve your technique and keep you safe too. Let's go on to the next one. So one of the things that we wanna keep in mind is also, we always talk about doing our training in a phasic fashion, right? You always hear me, especially on the webinars, people say, what's the best way to do this? And we say, wrong question, right? Wrong question gives wrong answers. So we always think about phasic training. So one of the things that we wanna consider is that we might actually periodize 
our flexibility mobility approach over time. And one of the things that we can start doing is once we have established kind of a pattern of some flexibility training, some full range of motion weight training, that's good, we'll keep it going. And then hopefully over the next few weeks, we'll actually start to see improvements in some of those flexibility and mobility characteristics. Great. Well, now, weeks, months later, we might actually start to see our athlete hitting the range of motion required to do his or her sport techniques the best way that they can, which is awesome. That's exactly what we wanted, right? But now, they've actually achieved the range of motion that we need. The question starts to become, do I need to continue trying to overload this flexibility and mobility training? The answer is probably no. You might be able to actually start de-emphasizing certain things and re-emphasizing other things, right? So for example, when you are trying to pursue flexibility and mobility, you might spend a lot more time doing things like static stretching, foam rolling, even vibration if that's an option, and a lot of that full range of motion weight training. Once the range of motion and technique that you have desired have been established, you might actually take those things away, take the time and resources that you were allocating to that, now put more into things like sport practice or full range of motion weight training. Weight training being a good option, especially if their strength has not caught up to their range of motion yet. So now we can start taking that away. We have a fixed amount of MRV per week that we're working with, so we're saying, all right, I'm removing that from the equation. That frees up either more recovery time or more time I can spend training something else, which is a very good option. So again, we want to make sure that they are still able to be strong in that range of motion. So once you start tapering down the flexibility training, it's very likely that you can start tapering up either the weight training or the amount of sport practice they're doing with that new awesome range of motion and be, the ability to express really, really good technique. So let's go on to the next one. So. One of the problems that I ran into a lot when I was coaching was, of course, rugby, scum of the earth. They are also not very flexible, which makes them even poor quality people. So one of the problems that we had to run into was we had some guys who were very inflexible and they could not crouch down in the scrum, which is that really awkward super man binding position where the two groups of guys collide and they try to push each other around, right? Well, it doesn't sound like it's that hard to do, but in order to maintain uh, rigidity in the scrum, each person has to maintain a very, very upright and direct posture as they crouch down. So a lot of people have a hard time actually getting into the crouched position while maintaining like a good arch position in their backs. So we had a lot of guys who simply were not flexible enough to do that yet, which seems odd, but we're really what that would translate into is they couldn't get down parallel with the flat back to the ground, so they would do it like this. And then what happens when the other team scrum? They would have a better position on us, right? So what do we have to do? Well, some really easy strategies to start off with, right? start doing some flexibility training. In this case, the hamstrings were a limiting factor. Their hamstrings were not up to par in terms of being able to express the best technique they could in the scrums, right? So we said, from my needs analysis, ah, we're coming full circle, you like that? All the way back to video one. My needs analysis, I identified a problem with a particular athlete or a couple athletes and said, normally, not a huge deal, but this time flexibility is a limiting factor for them being able to express really good technique in their sports skills. So we said, gotta work on hamstring flexibility. What were some things that we did? We did some really basic stuff, some sit and reach, some stretch and hold. Every now and again, we might even do some like PNF style stretching, not a huge deal. 30 seconds of pop, rest, hit it again, do a couple reps of that, no big deal. One of the things that we did use with success was vibration, and that was we were lucky enough to have access to a vibration platform. This was something we would do pre-training or even pre-sport practice at times. Um, it was really funny. A lot of them were not even flexible enough to do a reasonable bent over row, which most of you know you don't need to be super flexible to do that. Certainly being more flexible is helpful, but we're talking like they were standing straight up, right? One of the things that we did, put them on the vibration platform, target the hamstring, zap them for a minute, rest, zap them for another minute, and then went back to training. All of a sudden, now we're at about 50% instead of the full 100% like flat back uh, parallel to the ground. Now they're like halfway down which is way better than where they were before, right? So now they can do those bent over rows or whatever it is that they're doing in an enhanced position that they normally could not do. So we started doing that. We incorporated some hamstring movements into their dynamic warmup. And of course, you guys know me, we did full range of motion weight training, which included things like straight leg deadlifts, good mornings, back extension, glute ham raises, bent over rows, all with the fullest range of motion that we can 
And of course, we really made sure that they practiced their technique, not only unresisted, but also under resisted conditions like they would in a game, right? And what do we find? Well, over time, they started becoming more and more flexible. Over time, they started getting a little bit stronger at the bottom end of the range of motion. And over the course of a couple months, next thing you know, they can do the scrum down, no problem. The nice thing then is we can actually start taking things away. So as you see on the next slide, once we established that we, or excuse me, once we have established the requisite flexibility, we can start taking things out, right? So we started taking a lot of the stretching, vibration and stuff out. We really put a big emphasis on them doing as full range of motion as they could in the weight room. So squeaking down a little half inch to an inch every single set, every single time, over time started to add up, right? We really emphasized the good technique in the rugby practices and then the best part about it is once you achieve that, mobility maintenance is simply achieved through just periodization and sport practice. So if you are continuing to do full range of motion weight training using a variety of movements, doing full range of motion relative to your sport, using a variety of movements and techniques, the mobility characteristics are generally very easy to maintain so long as the person doesn't stop training altogether. If you stop training altogether, they will probably start reverting back to their less flexible state However, if you're still doing full range of motion weight training and you're still doing rugby in this case, you probably aren't going to revert too much. And even if they revert a little bit, like during their active rest or down times, a little bit of training brings them back up to speed in a relatively short amount of time. So again, we want to think phasic. We don't always want to think I am doing all of this crazy flexibility and mobility training all the time. I may emphasize certain parts of that and then I might reestablish with my monitoring program my requisite range of motion. Once I've said that, okay, we've hit the range of motion. I can take some things away and then hit the gas on other things. See where I'm going with this? Thinking like a sports scientist yet? I hope so. So that's really my big rant on flexibility and mobility training. Again, we don't wanna just use those terms loosely and just say like, oh yeah, flexibility is this, mobility is that, right? Flexibility is how far we can move our joint or muscle actions. Mobility is a task specific assessment and includes the range of motion needed for good technique and the strength characteristics within that technique. And we know that there's probably some upper and lower bounds to those things, meaning we don't necessarily need to just trying to blankly keep improving flexibility over time. Really what we're trying to do is get our athletes to do the techniques that they need to be successful to the best of their ability. Once we have done that, we can consider a phasic training model, start phasing some of those things out, start emphasizing some other things, and that will sustain the mobility characteristics for the majority of the time after that with some very, very, very minimal fluctuations here or there. Make sense? So I hope you guys enjoyed. This is my rant on flexibility and mobility training. We're gonna have a whole other series coming up on this even more in depth, but hopefully this kind of wet your whistle and gets you thinking a little bit more critically about doing flexibility and mobility training for your strength training program. All right, RP Plus, RPU, great seeing you again. I will see you next time.